endless groves in the ground on which we crawl or walk or run or dance nourish her with gratitude sharing together the abundant fruits we will follow the flow of freedom hold the hand of wherever we roam wherever we roam kindness frees the soul chained in fear and pain from long ago grace embraces all despair walk out unbound into the open Gentle streams persistent on a strong and stony mountain. Currents of compassion move and cut the deepest grooves. The human heart's got a fire. From our source who made us equal and free Radiate that warmth and light And liberate the new humanity We will follow the flow of freedom Hold the hand of hope Learn the lead of love Trust in the light will find us wherever we roam Trust in the light will find us wherever we roam Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Left Hand Church. My name is Heather Lynn. My pronouns are she or they. Welcome, welcome. We are gathering in this space together. If you would like to, uh, feel free to grab a cup of coffee or tea in the back. Please welcome our global branches with us online right now, watching via the virtual stream. So thank you for welcoming them. Uh, we thought we'd kick this off with a really fun song. I think of this often as a song about spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to rock me, mama. So feel free to clap or sing along um, or just make yourself more comfortable in this space tonight. Share this video as well if you're watching online, all right? Oh, 
Welcome, everybody. I'm Nicole, and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I have one really quick pandemic housekeeping issue to mention that's changed since last week. Um, we plan to continue to follow Boulder County's recommendations and guidance as we have throughout the past 18 months. And two things. Uh, last Tuesday, Boulder County issued a new public health order that affects our youth and children's programming. So for ages two plus, we are requiring masks for those activities to be in compliance with that order. And late on Friday, the county also issued a strong recommendation that everybody ages two plus, regardless of vaccination status, um, mask indoors in group settings like this one. So there's disposable masks in the back and out in the hall. Um, if you need one, we really deeply appreciate y'all's flexibility as this changes and um, all the care that everyone has shown throughout this weird and long season to take the best care of our least protected in the room. So we're gonna open with our ethos as we do each week. It's behind me on the poster and I would love it if you'd say it with me. Married, divorced, and single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt and believe here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ plus and straight here, there is no hate here. Woman, non-binary, and man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us grace here, in imitation of the ridiculous love that Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live and love without labels. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as each is able and willing, as a sign and a symbol of being together in this place, you can your feet or from your seat, if that makes the most sense to you and helps you be present, that is the point. I wrote this song a little while ago, inspired by a prayer that a friend of mine delivered, her name is Kate, uh, a some friends of ours in San Diego who have a church similar to ours, beautiful church family, you know it. Open hearts, open minds, spirits stirring within. What we do is we show up. 
So thank you for showing up today in all of our various shapes and sizes, all of our stories and our journeys, coming together to be with one another sharing love, sharing power, sharing grace. May we have open hearts and open minds to learn what Spirit is doing and desires to teach us today. Amen. Sometimes it feels like such a liberating confession to just say, 
I am becoming, I'm learning, I'm growing. If it feels comfortable to you, perhaps even now open your hands like this, if you so choose, if it feels aligned for you and you're comfortable. Opening your hands as a sign and symbol of an open heart to all spirit is doing in this very moment. I do believe divine love is on the move and holding us close together in our hearts. So we receive this blessing in our open hands and we ask that it be extended out uh, to those near us, to those far, to many we know and love and those we have yet to know. together if you're willing. God, thank you that in our sometimes obliviousness, you are wisdom and you are grace. And we are here with open hearts, open minds to receive, to listen, to honor this journey that you have called us to be on together in love and in mercy and in blessing. Thank you for the peace that you give, and even in times that we cannot feel it, we ask that you would keep us close. 
heal what needs to be healed, reconcile what needs to be reconciled in each and every one of our lives in the contention of the pandemic and all of the things that we are experiencing in this culture, in this world. Thank you for being our peace and for being love. And we are ready to be about that love and manifesting your love and peace in this world. And again, we give thanks, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all, beloved. Peace to your heart, your mind, your body, and your spirit. If you would like to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another, please do so with acknowledgement of uh, perhaps people aren't wanting to be touching right now. Um, But you can wave across the way. Um, or hugs where there's consent. If you're watching online, please definitely share the video, uh, share this experience so that people can join with us in worship and remembrance, in growth and learning and community together. We appreciate you. Please make sure you say hello in the comments as well. And one of our co-pastors will greet you uh, virtually. Uh, and also one of our co-pastors will bring us a message in just a moment. Everybody got quiet so fast. Everybody's afraid to talk because of the new Boulder County Um, Yeah, the whole mask thing. How do we all feel about that? Let's not talk about how we all feel about that. It is what it is. So when I was a kid, about 12 years old, my best friend Bob May and I always went down to the woods that was right behind Perkins Junior High School. We played in that woods all the time. And toward the western end of the wood, there was a swamp. We always thought of the swamp as a scary place to go, but I don't know why, when we were 12, we decided we need to go into that swamp. We went in about 75 feet, and by then, the mud was sucking our shoes off, and we decided that had not been a particularly good idea, so we turned around, headed back, took us forever to get out of there. We made a vow to each other. We would never go into the swamp lands again. That's what we called it the swamplands. The very next day, right after that, I came down with shingles in my right eye that almost blinded me in that eye, which I always blamed for having gone into the swamplands. But it's extremely important to note that is not good science. I'm just saying. But what I decided was true at the time. A lot of life is lived in the swamplands. Aeschylus, the Greek ancient writer, said, it has been ordained by the gods that the only path to wisdom is through suffering, which makes me think, am I really all that interested in wisdom? But suffering goes with us no matter what. The four great truths, the four noble truths, Buddha said, the first is life, is suffering. And that word suffering, dukkha, means suffering, but it also means impermanent and also means interconnected. That life is suffering, impermanent, and interconnected. Sounds delightful, doesn't it? You know, I think we're the only species that is alone and yet spends most of our time together with others. But you think about it, we arrive alone and we depart alone. I mean, surely there are those welcoming us when we arrive, happy to see us come. Nowadays, everybody does a gender reveal party. And evidently, one of the important aspects of a gender reveal party is to make sure someone is physically injured in the process. Not sure how I feel about gender reveal parties. If they had done one for me, it would not have turned out all that well, I'm just saying. But we want to welcome the arrival of new babies, and we love bringing that new life into the world. Everybody wants to hug and kiss on the new babies. And yet that child is going to recognize before long that they came into the world alone. A lot of the time they're going to spend alone. And when the time comes, 
they're going to leave it alone. Sure, there are those who will be running alongside them on the platform when their train finally leaves on its final departure. Those who will run to the very end of the platform, looking and watching as the train disappears in the distance. But it's you alone who is on that train. You know, it's interesting to me to be at that stage in my life where I realize the people I'm on the journey with now are probably the same people who are going to be running along that platform next to me when it's time for me to depart this journey. It's a sobering thought. It's also a comforting thought. So we arrive alone, we depart alone, but we spend a good bit of our lives in community with others. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about what does it take for your soul to embrace enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others. I said that slowly because it's not an easy concept. What is it going to take for your soul to be able to embrace enough willingness to live vulnerably to then move on into a relationship that is authentic in the presence of others? And one more time. What does it take for your soul? What does your soul need to be able to embrace enough, enough vulnerability to be able to live authentically in the presence of others? That is what we're going to talk about tonight. We're in our series on directions. And three weeks ago, I talked about why religion even exists in the world, where it came from. Two weeks ago, Christy talked about where religion is going, and particularly where this church is going. I loved what she said and the manner in which she said it. I was in Boston that weekend, but I actually watched it twice. I enjoyed it. Then John talked last week about the inward journey that all of us are on. And we're going to talk a little bit about that message later on tonight. And then tonight we talk about withward, how we journey together. What does our soul need to embrace enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others? That is where we're going. And I think there are three things necessary for us to be able to do that. The first one is that we have to be able to accept ourselves just as we are. And more than that, we have to be able to love ourselves just as we are. Religion has not been particularly good at that, teaching us to love ourselves. And yet that's exactly what's called for, to recognize that God, however you understand God to be, loves you exactly as you are. And being able, therefore, to love yourself just as you are, which you might have noticed is not always easy to do. Over the last 10 days, I've had at least three specific circumstances in which I have seen myself, parts of myself come out that I did not even know were there to possibly come out. I saw new parts to myself, three of them in 10 days, that I did not like, brought to my attention by my family. Delightful. Not exactly. What makes it even more difficult for me is, I mean, really, in 10 days, you find three new things about yourself that you really don't like, and you're 70 years old. I mean, does this ever stop? Well, the truth is, if your soul is willing to embrace enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others, nope, doesn't ever stop. Continues right to the end of this life, and I think probably into the life that comes. But it's necessary, therefore, for us to be able to love ourselves as we are. And I have gotten to that point in life. I didn't beat myself up for those things. I was happy to recognize them. I want to change them, but I also love myself as I am because it's the only decent way to live. The second thing necessary for us to be able to embrace enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others is to be willing to embrace life as it is. Not life as we wish it to be. Not even life as we're going to work hard to make it to be. But life as it is. For decades, I wondered why I was transgender. 
I studied everything I could study on the subject. It was critically important for me to know why I was transgender. And the truth is, we don't know why anyone is transgender. Three years ago, I did a two and a half hour interview with Radiolab, my favorite show on NPR. It never aired. It never aired because they decided being a science-based show that there just wasn't enough science on what it means to be transgender. So they did a series of shows on what it means to be intersex instead. I've had to come to embrace life as it is, to recognize it really doesn't matter why or what caused me to be transgender, just that I am, and better for me to live into it. You know, the great leader of the United Nations, Secretary General of the 1950s, died tragically in a plane crash in the fall of 1961, Dag Hammarskjöld. Shortly before he died, wrote fascinating words. Did he know his death was coming? He said, night is drawing nigh for all that has been, thanks. For all that shall be, yes. Night is drawing nigh, for all that has been thanks, for all that shall be, yes. Now that is someone accepting life as it is, not as they wish it to be, not as they're working to make it be, but accepting life as it is. I've been haunted and attracted by those words for a couple of decades now. I'm nowhere near getting there. It's aspirational. But I do hope I, in fact, can, before the end of my days, get to the point where I can say, at least on Tuesdays and Thursdays, for all that has been, thanks. For all that shall be, yes. My three favorite books for being able to accept life as it is would be his book, Markings, where you find those words, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, and Christian Wyman's book, My Bright Abyss. All three of those can help us to understand that we need to accept life as it is. And the third thing I think that is necessary for us to be able to embrace enough vulnerability to learn to live authentically with others is to accept the reality that a lot of life is going to be lived in the swamplands. We Americans team, seem to take an offense at that. I mean, it's written into our Constitution. We have the right for the pursuit of happiness, but somehow we think we have the right for happiness. And when we find ourselves in the swamp lands of the soul, well, we take that as a personal affront, and we deny that we're there, and we work hard to distance ourselves from it. And so we do anything we can to avoid the fact that we're living at the moment in the swamp lands of the soul. Exercising myself to distraction, that's my choice for how I do it, whether that's running or mountain biking. I'll run six days a week, anything, to not have to live in the swamp lands. Other people drink themselves to distraction, not wanting to accept life in the swamp lands, extremely dangerous. Still others work themselves to distraction. What if? What if we just accepted what people in many developing nations know, a lot of our lives is lived in the swamplands. And the best thing to do is just to find other people who recognize that same truth and to join with them in the middle of the swamplands and figure out how to move forward together. That, I think, is what we're trying to do right here at Left Hand Church. You know, I'm not a fan of religion. Religion is about helping people avoid hell. I'm far more interested in a spiritual community because I define a spiritual community differently. A spiritual community like, like Left Hand Church is for people who've already been to hell. Religion is for those trying to avoid hell. A spiritual community is for those who've already been to hell. And so what we want is to create life together in the swamplands where we can join together with other like-minded souls and figure out how to move forward in our lives together. I think one of the best ways to see how that is actually done is looking at Jesus' time with his disciples. In the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus finds out that his best 
friend, Lazarus, has died. And he tells the disciples that they're going into Judea. They're like, um, they want to kill you in Judea? He said, yeah, we're going anyway. And Thomas speaks up, and what does he say? He says, oh, let us go also, that we may die with him. Now, what he's saying there is that he's decided who he's going to hang out with in the swamplands, who he's going to move forward with. It's Jesus and the rest of the disciples. And come what may, that is his spiritual community. Even if it means they go into Judea and Jesus is killed and they are killed. Same thing kind of happens in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus has just told the disciples one of them is going to betray him, one of them is going to deny him, and he's going to leave. Not comforting words. So he wants to comfort them, and he says, In my father's house are a lot of rooms. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'll come back, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I'm going. Utterly incomprehensible. Who admits it? Ah, it's the same Thomas. And what does he say? We do not know where you're going. How would we know the way? And I love what Jesus says. Oh, Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Just follow me. We're a church, a Christian church, which means that we've decided to travel through the swamp lands together in the direction of Jesus. We want to love God love our neighbors, and love ourselves. That's one of the things that defines us as a community. We want to do the best we can to follow Jesus. But there was one other time, I think, when the disciples figured out how to work through the swamp lands together. Jesus is meeting with seven of them. Peter, who has arrogantly said he's better than the rest a number of times, has failed Jesus by denying even knowing him three times. And now they're all having breakfast, and all seven of them, Jesus says to Peter in front of the other sex, Peter, do you unselfishly love me more than the rest of these guys? I mean, the truth is, Peter knows. He's failed miserably. Everybody there knows he's failed miserably. There's no way he can say he unselfishly loves Jesus, because he knows he doesn't. He knows at the end of the day he's pretty darn selfish. So he says, yeah, I love you, but uses a different word for love. He says, I have tender affection for you. Jesus says, okay. Jesus says to him again, do you unselfishly love me? Again, very aware of his failings. He says, oh, I have tender affection for you. And Jesus says, okay. And then the third time he says, do you love me? And this time he uses his word for love. He says, do you have tender affection for me? And Peter says, oh. You know I do. And Jesus says, okay. And all seven of them know exactly what he's saying. He's saying, if you guys can't accept yourselves as you are, if you can't love yourselves, you're not going to be able to love your neighbor. Peter, it's okay. You are human. You messed up. How do we learn to make sure our souls can embrace enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others, I think we do it by loving ourselves, by embracing life as it is, not as we wish it would be, and by acknowledging that a lot of life is lived in the swamplands, and by finding a group of like-minded fellow travelers and traveling together in the direction of Jesus. That is who we are. So as a part of that process of traveling together through the swamplands, a number of you reached out to us in the last week. Because we have a lot of faithful questioners here, you were concerned about some of the things we messaged to you last week. We're concerned about those things too. And we want to make sure we clarify and correct some of what was said last week. On the subject of honoring parents and on the subject of forgiving parents. So I talked four weeks ago about how we can honor our parents. I said the best way to honor your parents is to live an honorable life. It's that simple. 
If you live an honorable life, you're honoring your parents, whether your parents recognize that or not. It's not up to you to convince them to understand you're living an honorable life. It's just to live one. And to forgive your parents, that's one of the most unfortunate passages in all of Scripture. Because there are a lot of times you, in fact, should not be forgiving your parents. A lot of us here grew up with abuse by a family member. And when you're abused by a family member, you're told, convinced by the perpetrator, that it was your fault, that you were the cause of your own abuse. And everyone who's under the sway of that perpetrator tells you that it's your fault. And you are filled with endless shame. The last thing you need to do is forgive that parent. Forgiveness offered prematurely is damaging to everyone. So what do you need to do? You need to do whatever work you need to do to get you to the point where you can finally say, oh God, it wasn't my fault. Yeah. It's not your fault. It wasn't your fault. It was never your fault. It was the sin of your perpetrator. And now, once you understand that, the healing can begin. And a lot of us find that a lot more healing could arrive to us if the person who abused us could get to the point where they're willing to admit the specific nature and, in fact, the specific occurrences of that abuse. I wanted so badly for my abuser to admit exactly what had been done to me. We both knew exactly what had been done. But I tried for a very long time and could not even get that person to say, oh, I made a few mistakes when you were growing up. Nope, I didn't even get that. And I certainly never did get an acknowledgement of specific things that we both knew had happened. Had that been acknowledged, it might have been a little easier for me to heal. And it might have been possible for me at some point to offer forgiveness, it's easier to offer forgiveness for someone who requests it. But it was never requested. And I stood over her casket 20 months ago. And the feeling I had was not forgiveness. The feeling I had was anger. And it's all right. It's all right. Maybe... At some point, forgiveness comes for us. Maybe it doesn't. That's not the important point. The important point is for you to heal from what was done to you. That's the important point. And we messaged something that said something else last week. It wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. As a church, as a community, we want to live with enough vulnerability to live authentically in the presence of others. When we mess up, we'll tell you. We're your leaders <laughs> trying to be on this journey through the swamplands. We're glad you're with us. We're glad so many of you faithful questioners brought those questions to us. And we will do our best. Because here's what we want to be. We want to be a community of those who aren't afraid of hell, but that have already been through it. Who are willing to embrace life in the swamplands and willing to walk together in the direction of dry land. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for loving us as we are. Thank you for helping so many of us here heal from uh, the things we went through 
with our parent or parents. Thank you for giving us a congregation that's willing to say the difficult things. And thank you for giving us the chance to move together through the swamplands, doing our best to follow Jesus, loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self till we can finally get to the dry land together. For this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. getting there. Nice pause to take it all in. <laughs> all right, here we go. out why take a trip to your dark side go on and have a good cry cause we're all lonely yeah we're all lonely together I want to see your sadness I want to share your sins I want to bleed your blood and I want to be let in Don't you just Don't we all just Want to be together
Let's together receive our gifts and offerings at this time. I do say receive because this isn't only about giving. I do see this withward journey, left-hand church. We are a living organism, and offering is one way of doing self-care for this whole, this collective, us together. So there are a few ways that we can be about this act of worship with our gifts and our offerings. You can check out, if you'd like to, lefthandchurch.org slash give to see all of the options and find what's most convenient for you. One of those ways might be to set up a recurring gift so then it can help us plan and strategize and look forward. Um, and then, I don't know, I find it convenient because then I don't have to think about it each month. Uh, the other ways are in person. Uh, I believe a bag is being passed around right now for offerings. And uh, there's paypal.me slash lefthandchurch. And I feel like I'm forgetting one way we can do our gifts and offerings, Christy. Did I cover it all? Lefthandchurch.org slash give, paypal.me. Oh, texting. If you want to text a one-time donation to the number 84321, that works. Jason, thank you so much for the slide with the information right there to even help, help a dear soul out like me who forgets things once in a while. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> you, you pretty much have it down every single week, so we can all mess up. <laughs> well, this is the time in our service each week where we join each other in communion. So if you're watching from home, um, please gather whatever elements you have and join us. Vulnerability, I'm gonna get this word right. Vulnerability is sacred. I look very closely for the vulnerability in those around me. I have a strong desire to protect that vulnerability to ensure that they are safe and cared for in whatever way the vulnerability arises. I have a strong connection to vulnerability and I have a strong disdain for abuses of power. The Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes made perfectly clear the expectation that we would look for the vulnerable and honor that vulnerability with love. In doing so, we are reaching beyond what is in front of us or what is our present reality, and we are inviting the sacred into our relationships. When I am vulnerable with you, and you are vulnerable with me, I do believe God is there. The whole, the whole when two or more are gathered there, I am there in the midst. It's the presence of the sacred. Communion is the telling of a trauma. As we sit with the understanding of the horror that was done to Jesus in his execution, we are bearing witness. We are bearing witness to injustice. We are bearing witness to something intensely private and very human. We are bearing witness to trauma. May we tell our stories. May we look for our shared humanity. May we be vulnerable. And may the sacred be present. Your vulnerability is sacred. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat in a room among his disciples to celebrate the annual Passover feast. He took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. This is my body broken for you. Take, eat, and remember me. Later that same evening, he took the cup. He blessed it, and he said, this wine is the blood of a new covenant, a promise for the redemption of all people, Take, drink, and remember me. At this church, we have an open table, which means that during communion, everyone without exception is invited to receive the gluten-free bread. We don't have that. We have gluten-free crackers, and we have regular bread and grape juice, which for us represents the body and blood of Christ. If you choose not to commune and you wish to stay in your seat, that's fine too. 
If you have a specific prayer request, which can be anything, it doesn't have to be big, it can be about a meeting, it can be about your drive home, anything that you would like a prayer for, Paula is going to be off to the side here and she will pray with you. If you would just like a blessing, then come with her with your arms crossed and she will um, do a blessing over you. We also have candles in the back of the chapel. If you would like to light a prayer and pray for someone or pray for something, we invite you to do that. We also have a prayer journal back there that we invite you to write in. So I invite you to come when you are ready. Uh, folks at home, please um, and take whatever elements that you have joining us in communion. When you're not so who you really are When all you feel is the shape of your sky you have more wounds than you can count. Open your eyes, look all around. You aren't alone. This is your song always makes me cry <laughs> and I love it when you way. sing it 
We just have a couple of announcements tonight. Um, the first is that we have our first ever baptism celebration coming up on August the 28th. It's gonna be at Flanders Park on the shores of McIntosh Lake. If you're an adult or you have a young adult who would like to be baptized, just reach out to Paula. You can email her at paula at lefthandchurch.org. And um, of note, this baptism service is also open to folks who were baptized as infants, but maybe want to re-experience that sacrament as adults. We already have a couple really special people that have offered that they will be baptized and we're really excited about it. It'll be followed immediately after with our August community dinner. That's usually on the third Saturdays, but it's not this month, it's on the fourth. So don't show up at Flanders Park on the third. We'll be there on the fourth. That's when we could get the pavilion. Um, so you can bring anything for potluck, bring your bathing suits, paddle boards, kayaks. Um, it's a great lake to get out on the water and uh, I think we already have four or five of those coming that can be shared a bit. So it'll be a nice night. Um, global branch members, please don't forget to join our back of church chat. We'll share the link in our group Facebook messenger here in just a moment and also in the branch Facebook group. If you need to find out what that is, you can also message the church on Facebook and we'd be happy to send it to you. For details on all of our events, you can see the events tab on our main church Facebook page. And that has all of our calendar of stuff coming up for the fall, of which there's a lot, which we'll keep talking about in the coming weeks. Um, so that's it from us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicole. Let's stand together as each is able and willing and sing this song together. Not that we are shelters for each other as some sort of insular enclave, isolated from the storms of life and from the world, but a shelter like a boat that Paula talked about. I love this old jars of clay song, so yeah. <laughs> All who are looking down, holding on to hearts still wounding. For those who have yet to find it, the place is near where love is moving. Cast off the robes you're wearing, set aside the names that you've been given. May this place of rest in the fold of your journey bind you to hold. You will never walk alone in the shelter of each other. We will live, we will live in the shelter. If our hearts are turned to stone, there is hope we know the rocks will cry out. And the tears aren't ours alone, let them fall into the hands that hold us. Come away from where you're hiding, set aside the lies that you've been living. And may this place of rest in the fold of your journey find you to hold. We will never walk alone in the shelter of each other. We will live, we will live in the shelter. Yeah. 
in hope We must all believe Our lives are not our own We all belong God has given us each other And we will never walk alone In the shelter of each other We will live We will live In the shelter So, dear beloved ones, Left Hand Church, as we go on our ways this week, may the most compassionate one grace us with courage and soul strength to be present to our tenderness and our rawness, our vulnerabilities that we may step into our individual and our collective authenticity. And may this power with and passion with, suffering with and celebration with, bear abundant life and beautiful things in and through our lives and living them. Let's go in peace to love God, love humanity, this planet, ourselves, and one another. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.